And there we go. That um, next month, so these will be being held every month on the second Tuesday of the month. Um, this talk is really going to be focused on health services. And just a nod to Dr. Marianne McCall next month on June 9th, we'll be talking about knowledge translation to policymakers. So back to our talk. So I'm here today with my colleague, Dr. Vince DePaul, and I'm, I put a whole host of other colleagues that um, we're here to represent. And I know that Joan Tranmer's on the line as, as well as um, Helen Cooper. Um, but this is really a, a team of researchers and, and who isn't on the screen here today are the hundreds of older adults that we've been working with to, to cope. So we're gonna start with a little bit of background of why this work we feel is critically important. Um, give this work a health service perspective lens today. Um, and then I'm gonna hand this over and uh, Vince is gonna take and, and speak a little bit more about the evaluation and expansion and the results and, and some of our next steps. So this is really quite appropriate and I, I do not have to tell everybody now in, in dealing with the pandemic what an issue um, our changing demographics are right now. So um, for those who have not been following, which <laughs> I'm sure that's not anyone, that we are in a, a shift of demographics around the world, not just here. It's a worldwide demographic shift and by the year, in only 15 years, they're expecting 25, up to 25% of the population of 65 and older. That's in Canada, but again, that is reflective a worldwide of the trends. Um, despite the news media, although long-term care is a huge issue, which I'll be talking about in a moment, most adults, older adults, live in non-institutional community settings, and they wish to remain there. Of these people living in the community, 50% anticipate they're going to be needing help five to 10 years from now. And 25% of older adults report feeling lonely. So there's a multiple things um, going on in the background and the backdrop um, to this project today. Um, you may know, but there's a very interesting study, the Harvard Study of Adult Development. Um, it is a 70 year, five year longitudinal study that actually started in 1938. And 60 older adults are still being followed to this day. So they looked at 724 men um, every two years they did a series of assessments. So they did interviews, they did medical history, um, a number of different outcomes. And they wanted to look at development over years. So they had a cohort of, of men who were Harvard attendees and a subset of, of men who came from underprivileged areas of um, Boston. And so I'm gonna throw it out there, although if we were together, we'd be having a bit of a conversation. You know, what do you think was the most important factors in terms of longevity and positive outcomes? This is where we would have a bit of a discussion. So you might be thinking of a lot of things, thinking about maybe their backgrounds, good relationships keeps us happier and healthy, healthier. And so they found social connections resulted in healthier, happier, and longer life. And quality was most important, not just quantity. And those, what is most fascinating, who are most satisfied with relationships at age 50, that was the strongest predictor of health at age 80. And there's a lot of research out there, and I've linked to the TED Talk um, about that study. Um, the loneliness and, and lack of uh, social connections and, and isolation is as great as risk factor of death as smoking, obesity, and lack of exercise. And so around the world, governments have actually taken action. And many of you might have seen this already, but in the UK, there's actually a ministry of loneliness. And so I think, you know, when we talk about it initially with social distancing and people recognized that's not the term we want because people are recognizing how imperative it is for people to connect now more than ever. And so this work again is just so in tune with, with what's happening um, in the world right now. And we hope you see Oasis from, from that lens as well. And so when we think about supporting older adults, traditionally we think of sort of two main sort of rounds of, of care. And, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about healthcare service provision now. So we think in care, we think institutional supports. So again, the long-term care, and retirement homes and again a lot about retirement our long-term care is in the news right now so again you'll be with me when I, I start to give you some numbers 
And then we think about at-home care. So we're thinking more broadly about community health and support services. So thinking about the broad range of services from primary care, home care, community support services, social services, and then informal supports, families and friends. So again, we are, this is highly in the news media and just again, highlighting long-term care, not only is it costly, and this is a, a recent, um, you can follow the link here at below, $4.28 million of provincial funding a year towards long-term care. Not only that is, it's not where people want to be. We hear this frequently in Oasis, that people want to stay in their homes as long as they can. The wait list is almost 35,000 Ontarians. And at the bottom, you can see that there's been a huge focus on building more long-term care. But even despite billions of dollars being put into built new builds, we will still have extraordinary wait lists. 82% of COVID deaths have occurred in long-term care. So long-term care is an issue. So if we turn to the community services, you know, I'm gonna orient you here and you've got all these little people out on the outside. So older adults living on their own in the community. And what happens is services are oriented to, to the services themselves, not oriented to the people who need them. So older adults, for the most part, must go to services versus services coming to them. Now that's with the exception of home care, of course, which again provides services in the home. The median age was 81 of people receiving home care and 71% of care provided was personal support. Um, I think what's the most interesting though of this is that there's $20 million in extra services people are purchasing because home care is just grossly underfunded to provide the care needs for those living at home. And again, you'll see home care is going out individually to homes and there's far less orientation of services to communities. And so there's been a lot of talk when we think about how do we support older adults and thinking about integrating care into communities around the needs of older adults to support healthy aging. So reorienting our lens completely in terms of how we think of providing care. In Ontario, we're talking about Ontario health teams and a way of organizing and delivering care that's more connected to patients and their local communities. So again, sort of this idea of reorienting care to people, not services. Um, we did some interesting work. Um, one of the senior ISIS analysts, ICS analyst, Paul McGuin, um, has looked at the census data. And what he did for us was he looked at, they're called distribution areas. And so they're small little components of the census tracts of up to 700 people in these small geographical locations. And what he did was he mapped out by age the distribution areas. And you, what you'll find is stark and very interesting when you think about health service delivery. So you can see in the top picture in 2006, again, red is 80 to 100% adults, 55 and older living in that area. And it almost is like a fire as we go through from 2006, 11 to from 2006, 11 and 16, to see the number of areas or what we call naturally occurring retirement communities. So we call these communities that have 40% or older, 40% um, of older adults living in this small distribution area. So in 2006, 8.7% of distribution areas in Ontario um, were, would be considered NORCs, and now 20% in 2016, and we only expect this to increase. Um, so if we just have a nod to our local region, so you can see to the left of your screen um, is Central Ontario, and to the right here is Eastern Ontario, and you can see, particularly in the rural areas, you know, how many naturally occurring retirement communities we have. Um, if we drilled this in, you can see particularly at the bottom, Kingston, the islands area, you know, how many older adults are in our region. So we're here to talk about a solution. And so again, as I mentioned, Vince and I have had the great privilege of, of working with Helen and, and Oasis and all the older adults and really building on uh, a decade's worth of work that was done. And so the goals of OASIS Senior Supportive Living is to support social engagement and participation among seniors and old, older adults living in naturally occurring retirement communities. And you can see on the right, adding life to years and years to life. And this was actually created by the members themselves. And that's 
uh, a nod. So approximately 10 years ago, just over, um, Christine McMillan was the driving force behind this. And for people who know Kingston, this is the Bowling Green 2 building, um, just behind the Kingston Center, and worked together with a group of older adults to develop the OASIS program um, within the building. And they work closely with their landlord, Homestead Land Holdings, who donated private space and have been running this program um, for over a decade. And I'll talk a little bit about what actually that looks like. So OASIS has four main pillars. It has a nutrition pillar, so three times a week, older adults um, get together in their downstairs. And, and I say this used to get together and I'll talk a little bit about um, now COVID times, um, would come together three times a week for a catered meal service that was partially subsidized. Um, and it, they also included physical activity program. And again, that looks like a variety of different things. Um, you can see here, wee bowling occurring and there's line dancing at certain um, facilities, um, different, um, BON smart programs. There's also, again, one of the core pillar is socialization. So looking at ways that older adults come together, you can see um, a, a group of people there at a, at a writing, a creative writing um, program. There's guest speakers from around um, the different community service agencies. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And most importantly, the on-site coordinator, uh, Tina Carson, um, who's been with the program since its inception. And two important elements too that I, I have to highlight uh, as saying is crucial is OASIS member meetings. And I say that because they are the driving force and the idea behind OASIS is that it's run by and for the members. So the older adult OASIS members are the ones that decide the programming needs. So there's these, three core pillars of programming, but it's completely run and directed by the older adults and supported by the on-site coordinator. And lastly, and most importantly as well, is the board of directors um, who are a board of volunteer members who are in, impressively well situated in the community. So um, Helen Cooper, who is the president, um, was the past mayor of Kingston. We have other city councillors, someone who sits um, at public health, someone who was the past president of, of home and community care. So again, you know, having these important um, individuals be a voice for, for the program has been critical. So I'm going to go back to the, the first slides I also was showing you about how traditionally care is oriented. So again, care is traditionally centered around care itself and people have to go to it. Whereas again, thinking about OASIS, how we've done it is we've reconfigured how we orient supports. So supports are actually created and self-created by the older adults themselves. And there's um, so many different stories that we could share with you today about how individuals have, have created and come together in their community and support each other. Um, but we also look to bring services into OASIS. So for instance, we have been connecting with the family health team and who come in and have been providing education sessions versus having older adults go out to these sessions. Um, we have had now, we have the Canadian he and Hearing Society giving monthly hearing clinics, for instance. Um, social services, we've had the elder law come in and do a series of guest lectures. And we've also been working with home and community care and reorienting home care instead of going out individually to think about a cluster model of care where one um, care attendant comes in and provides care to a building. So again, shifting how care is delivered. Um, again, I'm not going to, I won't spend too much time here. And again, these are, we've done a series of interviews with both the original um, OASIS members and our expansion sites. And again, everything about the programming is about bringing people together and having these opportunities to connect. Um, again, these are, are members of the original Oasis community and, and just this notion of, of building this family. And um, this term family and this co-created family is a, a thread that we've seen now throughout the, the expansion sites as well. And again, just the, this fact that people are coming to them to, to do exercise. And again, instead of having to go out to the VON exercise, the VON comes and delivers exercises 
um, there. And so I'm just also uh, mentioned about the on-site coordinator. This is not meant to be a healthcare role, um, but the role becomes almost like a systems navigator. So again, thinking about back to that vision where the services are out there, um, that coordinator does a wonderful job of helping to identify what the members would like and bringing those services into OASIS as well. Um, you're probably wondering how on earth are we doing this now um, in times of COVID and physical distancing. And so again, we could spend the entire day talking about the incredible ways that they've been connecting. Um, but we have quickly mobilized ourselves and we have gone virtual. And so we've discussed, we've called ourselves the Oasis Without Walls. And again, this is a, an email that we've got some, have some OT students, occupational therapy students who are running um, every day um, Zoom coffee and chat times. And, and we're going to be moving to doing some virtual exercises as well. So I'm going to pass this over to Vince in a second. I think I've, I've spoken about the um, essential ingredients. Um, and I'm going to hand the reins to Vince and he's going to be taking it from there um, and, and talking about how we've worked for the last two years to expand um, and evaluate OASIS. So thank you, Catherine. Um, so Catherine will advance the slides and the animation. So I'll give you the big subtle <laughs> to say thanks. So um, so if we talked uh, so the um, so what we're we've done is as Catherine um, mentioned is we've now taken the step of moving the uh, this model that has been successful for ten years to expand it to other sites. Um, so we're going to go through the um, process of of how we've approached that, um, but critical to that was the the philosophy of involvement of the older adults themselves from the original to identify what the next steps will be but also at the um, potential sites as we'll hear about so we um we were the the project objectives we set out to develop these new oasis communities and diverse ontario communities so thinking about um diversity in location so in more than just kingston diversity in um the uh, we'll talk about marginalization level so um, we purposely tried to um, identify groups uh, where there was low uh, medium and high uh, levels of marginalization we'll talk about how we did that also in um, the Catherine alluded to the, um, the the generosity and the involvement of homestead land holdings and the original Oasis has been, their partnership has been critical and they've been very, very generous um, with them, but also with us. Um, however, we wanted to show that this wasn't just a one-off um, uh, between a, a kind landlord and a community and whether this could be tested in other, uh, with other landlords and other property owners. So that was um, part of that diversity. We um, are the other big um, objective was that we want to develop a process guide to um, for future um, replication it, uh, of the Oasis model. We've had lots of interest, and Helen will attest to. She gets regular calls about spreading this model to by older adults living in other apartment buildings, and when can we have an Oasis? So that's part of our goal, and we wanted to evaluate the impact of oasis on a number of outcomes including social connectedness physical and mental health um, participation and health utilization <laughs> you can advance uh Catherine, sorry um so the this was not just a um as we say a kingston centric we we partnered with a number of people including um, academic partners at western um, and mcmaster as well as um, a number of uh, partners within queens so the department of family medicine the school of nursing um, the department of economics um, in our, in this project we also reached out to the uh, as we'll talk about throughout the project the regional um, health authorities within the Kingston but in in Hamilton and London and um, Belleville 
as well uh, to support the programming that we've launched within each of these buildings. They, and as I said, the homestead is certainly deserves highlight because not only have they supported the original Kingston um, building, but they, um, they were keen to and supportive of uh, uh, one of the expansion sites in Kingston is also a homestead building. And in London, they connected us with uh, the London site when, um, when one of their buildings looked like it was a potential eligible site. So they've made that connection. Um, other landlords included the CGM um, in Kingston, another large landlord, and, and um, Effort Trust in Hamilton, as well as uh, we'll talk about an interesting um, site in Belleville, Trenton area. So the process of expansion, um, we can just move on to the next one. So it was the stepwise approach. So first we took Census Canada data and identified where these uh, naturally occurring retirement communities in terms of proportion of older adults were. So where, uh, and we set the bar at 25% just um, to be inclusive. Um, and said, where are people living in these, these high density areas in these four cities? Um, the, we also looked at the Ontario Marginalization Index, which is a composite index that includes income, um, uh, I think resident stability, um, uh, ethnic makeup, and I'm forgetting the final, but uh, it's a number of, of um, of variables that go into to this uh, number and we so we considered that and then um, from that we identified potential um, uh, living settings and buildings within these communities and uh, went to the Google Maps and Street View and, and identified what else was in those areas um, so looked at their walk um, uh, rating looked at what whether what was surrounding them in terms of services um, all uh, uh, in, a, in a way to try and um, select uh, eligible but also a diverse group of um, uh, settings so once we identified potential sites we went to the building itself and basically cold called um, and made an appointment with the landlord and um, looked at the space and um, sought a landlord agreement to provide in-kind space to hold programming. Um, not every building and every community has space, which we, um, which we quickly figured out. Uh, so we set a minimum um, sort of uh, level of that there had to be some space to, for people to meet and socialize and run programming um, it it was uh, and we were able to find that in a number of buildings that, we, that ended up being on our list there uh, but most critically the uh, 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 um, eligibility criteria was that residents had to be interested so not only interested in participating but also in co-developing um, and that that often was again through liaison with the um, the landlord, they would identify uh, individuals within the building who were active and interested in would maybe be a good um, uh, champion. And so we met with them and, and eventually identified um, six expansion sites in, in the, the four cities that we're talking about. So there's six um, in, after the process, and this was not without some false starts, but in the end, we had um, six naturally occurring retirement communities in four communities. In um, Kingston, we have a three new expansion sites. Quinty West, which is a, the small community sort of that borders Belleville and Trenton. Um, we have one uh, mobile home park, which we're very excited about. Um, uh, we have an uh, apartment complex, a multi-building complex in Hamilton, and a multi-building complex in London, Ontario. The, um, the, these represent both public and private housing, um, and again, across the marginalization um, levels uh, for each of the areas. Both the 
uh, and the, we also intentionally chose sites that were large urban and, and more rural. Um, the uh, Quinty West would be fall into that category. So at each of the new sites, um, we have programming launched since January 19, 2019. Um, socialization uh, focused programming, including these coffee drop-ins, arts and crafts, paint nights and paint afternoons, um, guest lecture series has been very um, popular at all the sites, uh, pulling in these community services and community experts provide information on a variety of topics, um, again, selected and identified by the members themselves. Uh, there's been advocacy work, um, bringing in city councillors at all the sites actually to be, to introduce the, the members to the councillors. And this again is something the members identified as important, as well as identifying needs around their building or within uh, their community that they wanted to speak to them about it and volunteerism that the members themselves were volunteering within OASIS, so helping each other, but also supporting other groups. The, the um, original OASIS has been doing this for many years, doing um, knitting for the hospital, um, the diocese uh, program, and uh, the new OASIS buildings have, have picked up that lead. We also have nutrition programming. Um, there's some level of communal nutrition at all the sites, um, it looks differently at the different sites, including some as a catered meal, but others at as um, community kitchens and cooking together. Um, some are barbecues in the uh, lower income uh, communities, bringing in uh, food rescue programs and, and uh, education related to shopping. Um, and again, physical activity under that pillar, um, promoting uh, exercise in formal exercise, sitting exercise, standing, um, different levels that are appropriate, but also more um, active uh, recreation, including a very vigorous line dancing group out in uh, Quinty West. The, um, so our evaluation approach has been, it's a, we're, we're doing a multiple case study design with mixed methods, so both qualitative and quantitative data collection. Um, consistent with the philosophy of OASIS, uh, it's a participatory research approach. Um, so we have older adult members and, uh, and the board um, involved at all stages. And, uh, and we've been, you know, so when we're seeking new grants, we have people sitting on these grants and giving feedback on the, the uh, actual um, submissions. The, we are interviewing, um, We've, we've done interviews with uh, the members themselves, as well as other stakeholders, um, including the landlords um, and the, some of the care providers or the service providers. The, our, we have quantitative measures, including um, self-report questionnaires um, of around loneliness and social connectedness. Um, we have physical uh, performance measures around mobility. Um, uh, we're, measuring physical activity with wearable devices um, and where we have again some questionnaires related to nutrition and mental health. In addition to all of this we've been able to access data uh, through the ICES related to health utilization. So in our evaluation plan we are started with a comparing the original OASIS to the baseline um, status of the new expansion sites and this would be a pre-implementation baseline. Eventually um, we moved on and we have some, we've begun to collect um, baseline to uh, follow up and in some of our, um, in the new buildings and we'll talk a bit about that, um, where that's, that uh, process is right now. Focus right now though is on that baseline to, um, or the original OASIS comparing it to the pre-intervention phase of the, the new expansion sites. So we won't spend too much time but on this. Again, these are um, some of the qualitative content from the interviews, but looking at the um, self-report measure, we use the UCLA three-item loneliness scale. So this, this is a well-used um, 
accepted tool for loneliness and it basically dichotomize, it can dichotomize people into lonely or not lonely based on their scores on these three questions. So only 6% of the members of the original OASIS were identified as lonely compared to 32% at the baseline of the new sites. So quite significant in terms of this. Um, communal meals, again, um, some of the qualitative, um, this, was, this is essential and um, from the original OASIS members who have been advising us <laughs> in every step of the way, they, this is critical in their mind in terms of eating together. Um, and the, the, when we measured their nutrition status using something called the screen, um, the, the um, people at the original Oasis, the members, 65% uh, of them um, scored as healthy or um, healthy nutrition levels versus only 43% in the new sites. So again, physical activity as the other pillar. So self, this we will just talk, we've done a number of different ways of measuring this, but self-reported physical activity at the original Oasis, um, if you look at the yellow um, slice of that pie, the proportion of people who were not active um, was much smaller than when we look at the baseline at the new sites um, compared to 14, 13% compared to 40% of the people at the new sites who self-reported as being not active. And falls, so we know how important falls are to the health of older adults and it's a major problem in, in um, older adults, including community dwelling older adults. So the, the number of people who reported at least one fall or um, in the last six months um, was higher in the new sites, um, uh, significantly higher, particularly at the, um, when we look at the level of two or more falls and 26% uh, compared to 5% in the original OASIS. And this is despite, um, with all of these data, this is despite actually uh, um, the, when you look at the age group, um, the, the people in the new OASIS sites trend towards being younger compared to the original OASIS. So it can't be explained just by the age of the members. So now we're looking at the health utilization. Um, so the health, the patterns of health utilization. Um, so this data is comparing the original OASIS building. What we did was we, um, looked at data, uh, nine years of health utilization data going back from um, now, uh, or the most recent data available, to just after the, the program was set up. Um, and we, uh, through the assistance of um, Paul at uh, the ICS, um, we were able to compare it to a matched non-OASIS cohort. Um, so we, we did two to one matching, or almost two to one, um, to strengthen the, um, the analysis. So this is looking at um, visits to family physicians. Um, so I'll just say that over, these are means for the most part, well, I'll identify where we use medians. And these are um, the, uh, over the period of time that they were um, within the building each of the, at each of the sites. So 45 compared to 50. Um, and again, these are trends towards um, increased utilization uh, or reduced utilization in the OASIS versus the non-OASIS. So ED visits, emergency department visits, again, uh, 4.6 compared to 5.3% um, of the uh, members had um, uh, visits to the ED. We'll go. So the um, number of hospitalizations to, um, so uh, there was the, on average per person, there was a 2.37, um, and this was equal at each of the sites. Um, but the average length of stay of those hospitalizations was uh, trends towards less uh, in the OASIS sites. And some of the, although these numbers, um, these are small numbers and um, when we look at the ICS data, particularly, they're typically used to working with thousands of patients, but we're, um, so to see some of these trends, although 
there is overlap in the numbers um, when we look at the standard deviations, it's still um, going in the right direction. So then, um, importantly, we also were interested in the home care use um, of these these participants and these members. So um, when we look at the whether the person over their time had any uh, use of home care, 22% in the OASIS versus 31% in the non-OASIS. So there was increased use of home care in uh, without OASIS. The uh, when we look at acute so this is short-term um, uh, home care use. Uh, so typically after discharge from a hospital or a short burst of, of home care. Um, this uh, less than five, so any value that says less than five means um, we can't report on it just because of the risk of um, uh, revealing the, the person themselves. So we, but we know that's a low number and compared to 12% on the matched OASIS site. And uh, the access to rehab through home care, 12 versus 15, um, maintenance servicing, uh, eight versus 13, and again, long-term support um, was uh, a less than uh, five in the OASIS building versus 5%. So there's the overall a trend towards less um, use of home care services. The, um, when we look at uh, one of the, the, the um, feelings um, and sort of anecdotal, anecdotal feelings from the OASIS uh, members themselves is that this, this program keeps them in their, their homes. And that's sort of one of the major intentions. So when we look at the, whether the, um, this shows up on the ICS health utilization. So it's just long-term care admissions. Um, so there, there wasn't a significant, when we look at a difference between um, the, the OASIS versus matched no, uh, match non-OASIS, um, uh, 12 to 10%. Um, however, um, years to admission. So this means number of years that they were in the building before they had to be admitted for the for the subsample of people who were admitted. Um, so again, 3.7 years compared to 3.5. But these are again are means. So if we, uh, if you just click again, the, um, when we look at medians, so the reason to look at medians would be that the median, so 50% of the people were, um, that number is a little bit different than the mean. Um, so 3.5 compared to 2.8. So using the median, there seems to again be a trend towards a uh, sustaining people in their home for a, uh, just under a year um, more before having to actually um, transition to uh, long-term care. So again, these numbers need to be validated and um, we're continuing to collect ICAS data on uh, the new sites, which will continue. So when we think about the um, this averting transition to long-term care, there's data that was collected before we became involved. Um, and uh, so this is looking at, uh, in June 2015, 12 members of the OASIS community were deemed eligible um, using the inter um, tool to identify people who would be eligible for long-term care. Uh, and each those people were deemed to be able to be eligible, but were able to stay in the community. So at a cost of $64,000 per year, um, that works out to an annual savings of 645,000 or more. Um, and that cost, I think is, um, we've seen that's a conservative cost when we think about the overall cost of long-term care. So um, again, we want to thank the, the many, many members of the, our team who are involved and continue to be involved. Um, we finished the original grants, but we're continuing to seek funding to extend this work to, um, to uh, look at the longer term impacts. I'm just gonna, um, well, I think that, and I'm just gonna um, say one nod, thank you, Vince. Um, and just to let everyone know in terms of you, you might be wondering about the cost to run an Oasis site, and that might be a question that comes up. 
Um, so we received a significant amount of money for the expansion sites, but not the ongoing. So we are seeking and, and working closely with the board of directors, but we the average cost of a building if you have a full-time coordinator with subsidized meals is approximately a hundred thousand dollars um, to run for a year and so when we think about the costs of, of long-term care and and all of the um, under use and under ability to access home care services and and the supports that they give each other again thinking about that cost benefit and I'm just I'll leave it at that and I'm sure people might might have some questions for us I was sent a question privately, but I'll answer it publicly. Um, one of the questions just about the demographics, and this is relevant, um, it was the, the makeup of, of men to women. So these, these buildings at all the sites, there's some variation, but definitely there's more women um, uh, than men, which is consistent with the larger demographics. Um, so I, um, I would say it's 75%. Uh, women to 80% depending on the building um, for each of the sites. And the, when they're, uh, again, not always the case, but tends to be uh, when there are men, men um, are with their wives, um, and um, but there are some uh, widowed uh, men as well in the buildings. But many people live by themselves, uh, either men or women. I just see a question about a modified diet accommodation, and that's a good question. Um, definitely, when the caterer, um, both myself and, and Helen, volunteer delivering or serving meals each week, and they do accommodate to some extent, uh, most definitely. Um, there has been remarkably few diet restrictions, but overall, the, the meals are designed to be healthy, and so low sodium, low sugar, and so people are very conscious about sort of the health requirements. Um, so I guess that's what I'll say. And for the most part, too, if there are some dietary issues, it's a small community, so it's it's really quite easy to navigate that as well. Uh, Catherine, it's Joan. Hi, Joan. Hi. I I always just love this project, but now you know your introduction with respect to the impact of COVID and all the issues in long term care. Um, the importance of this work is even more important. I, I'm, I'm not saying that well, but um, yet a lot of your activities are based on group interaction and and and, and that relationship building. So, I mean, there is it's so important to do this. Yet your work is embedded in what we can't do. Yes. So I so I don't know how what what the next step would be yes and so that's a very good point and i, I see helen and alan um are on on the line as well and um we've pivoted quite a bit and, and as i mentioned joan trying to in, in the initial point do online and and actually part of that online delivery is is building up their capacity to use some of the online programming sorry <laughs> um but I think we will be doing some sort of blended sort of delivery for, for quite some time. And we'll have to be thinking about, you know, in the next couple of years, thinking about smaller meals, for instance, and maybe there's less people at tables or they congregate in, in different ways. But you know, it, it will impact Oasis quite significantly. I don't know if Helen, Helen or Alan want to weigh in on that. Um, well, hey, we are, uh, we have the coordinator working from home. <clears throat> and she, excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. Um, she, <clears throat> she has uh, been in regular phone contact with the members uh, to check on their circumstances and friendly reminders about what they should or shouldn't be doing. Uh, and uh, she's been ordering uh, meals for people who need them uh, to be delivered. And I think sometimes it's uh, just to pick me up for them because this is getting uh, to be extremely onerous. I would still say that I think the people in the Oasis program are better off than they would have been if there hadn't been an Oasis program where they would have been isolated in that building without 
the ability to connect at all. You know, the other lesson we've learned, though, is that our program coordinator had been working with members to make them much more computer literate. And we had purchased, or I think Kasia in your program had purchased some tablets. And that's a lesson that I've learned out of this, that uh, when we get back to any kind of communal activity at all, I think we're going to really stress that people learn basic internet connectivity. Because uh, it makes, uh, for the ones that are connected, the program coordinator is sending them stuff every day from, you know, traveling around the world to you name it, uh, fun stuff as well. And I think that's making a huge yeah, difference. Yeah, and I'm going to build on that, Helen. And, and it was interesting. We've been working with lots of different Queen students over the expansion, and, and we've actually been running... Um, these technology sessions, one-on-one -on -one technology sessions. So a number of our members have gone from even before COVID, not ever being able to use a cell phone to, you know, being savvy. And, and so they, we actually had all of the, the materials handy um, that we had created manuals to how to use a smartphone, a laptop and a tablet. So we just quickly um, brought that out and we're just in the midst of, of trying to um, purchase more iPads and, and figuring out a way of having a lending library at the sites. Um, but again, I, I can see us doing some sort of blended um, activity for, for quite some time. And we're thinking of even having, you know, virtual meals and, you know, the sky's the limit in terms of how we're, we're looking at doing it, but it's going to be like this for some time. And I, I, I would just again build on what's been said that I think the benefit of this model has been to build connections that are, that make these older adults more resilient and more connected during this time, but then um, also trying, we're trying and it's already happened um, uh, to uh, transition to a more virtual or remotely delivered um, uh, Oasis. So, so I think there's lessons to be learned both ways. And I'm just going to say one last thing on this um, because it, you know it's obviously Joan to your point has impacted the very core of, of Oasis, um, having to not be able to see everybody. Um, but the power of of having these communities, which I think um, Helen's alluded to, and and how people are rallying around each other. So people who are maybe more mobile than others are, are now having groups of people that they're going and doing grocery delivery to. And, and it's, it's it unbelievably heartening to see these communities um, come together. And, you know, the Oasis original has longstanding roots, but even these new communities who've known each other, they, they went from not knowing their neighbors to a year and a half later, having strong connections and, and supporting each other almost on a daily basis. And our, our students call each people, everyone each week and to see how they're doing. And again, they're really relying on each other through this time. So we have another question in the chat box. Sure. Uh, Jody wants to know if you can tell more about getting landlords on board with these projects and if there are government incentives. Mm. Yeah, the, um... So the, we've, the, the landlords all, as I said, Homestead was obviously supportive. All the landlords have been supportive in, in different cities. Um, and the, we've spoken with the, the, the landlords have also been helpful to identify potential incentives. And I'm not gonna remember the exact wording, but there are, there are um, often in each community, sort of this, in order to develop, a new building there's the, a, a developer has to commit to a community um, contribution so they've identified that as a potential way to incentivize um, the the landlords to put in recreation space or put in common space um, to support these programming um, it's the engagement of landlord has been um, been uh, very positive um, in our experience in the in the expansion. So and uh, and we've had again other people approaching us about the potential to and even within the the landlords um, supporting the buildings that we're in, they are keen. You know, many of them have said, "Can we? How can we expand to other buildings within their sort of properties?" Um, it's more the 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 cost of of the on-site coordinator is sort of that 
um, barrier to taking that leap, but but there's lots of support. Mm -hmm. I'm just reading Stacy saying I mentioned a mobile home park. Um, yes, yeah, so you know the interesting thing. I'm glad you brought this up, Stacy, about um, um, rural areas because if you think back to the the Nork um, images from you know as they went from 2006 to 20. 2016, you should be attuned to thinking about a lot of those were occurring in rural areas where there's not necessarily high dense apartments like we've been targeting in some of the um, other cities. So, you know, I think that's why we were really excited to have the mobile park area and thinking about how we might conceptualize the Oasis in these rural centers, you know, not quite necessarily like a senior center, sort of to, to say those words where people are coming, but you know, how can we, you know, reconceptualize more rural type norks? And and we haven't gone down that path in a very rural way, but it's something clearly the data is showing that that's needed as we look at these maps. And uh, yeah. to build on that, that actually something that this COVID situation is, has sort of opened up is this idea of, of Oasis without walls. So um, we're, we're targeting people with already within these these communities but it depending on how things go it this could be a way to connect people beyond sort of the geographical um confines of a of a building so this may be something yeah uh, Catherine and Vince it's Helen I'm interrupting in terms of the landlord issue first of all Homestead is really keen and it, uh, Homestead is the fourth largest landlord in the country mm -hmm. so I think that uh, is an advertisement in and of itself. They're quite open in saying they benefit. They benefit because uh, their ten the tenancies last longer. Uh, high turnover in a building is expensive, and uh, their tenants are good. They pay their rent. Uh, they uh, don't have wild parties. They don't destroy their units, and um, they the people uh, associated specifically with the older oasis say uh, they've noticed complaints from tenants uh, diminish uh, because tenants are happier. They uh, don't let other little things in their lives bother them as much as if they were lonely and self-absorbed. I'm gonna um, talk to two, questions, two points here that was raised. Um, Stacy, just to your point about the differences between the sites, I'm going to say the biggest difference, and I didn't mention this about the mobile park, is that they have to leave their buildings. So we had a little bit more insight because in all of the other apartment buildings, everyone just takes an elevator down to the main lot, to their, their meeting room. Whereas it was interesting, there was a community space, uh, I guess it was a community hall within the park. And so we have actually had the biggest number of turnouts at the um, mobile park home than anywhere, actually. And so just the act of getting to the park, to the center is, is part of the exercise and activity. And they were actually the most lonely, I guess I, I would have to say, just from what their stories were because they didn't see each other in the halls. So again, in some ways there was more incentive to get out um, and see each other, but it did add a little bit of a barrier, but it, it seemed to still um, not be a barrier completely. And Eunice has just talked about the OHTs, Ontario Health Teams, and most definitely once um, sort of the planning gets back on track again um, we see that oasis is is an exemplar um, in terms of how OHTs could be thinking about geographically oriented services and, and bring services to populations um, so do landlords bear the cost of adapting yes they do and this is the most remarkable part of this whole um, program is that they are completely on board and in two of the sites they have um, completely renovated space, um, the original Oasis and we've got a new site that they converted a furnace room actually into a, a, an Oasis site for us and all the other buildings have, have done some sort of upkeep or upgrade for us as well. Um, and another question about uh, plans going forward given COVID. You know, again, it's it's going to be just in terms of what we've been alluding to, is thinking about how to continue on in an online in an online format. And I think, in some ways, as Vince has mentioned, it's given us an opportunity to this idea. We consciously use the word "without walls" 
um, to expand our community out beyond people living in the apartment buildings and, and you know slowly growing people who might be be wanting to to make these connections um, I don't know if anyone wants to add anything I don't know um, Helen or Alan <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'll unmute. Uh, no, uh, I, I can't think of anything. I, uh, I must excuse myself as well. Uh, the chap from Vancouver is calling me at one o'clock. So, Very good. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, it's Oasis up. Day for me. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, uh, thanks very much. And uh, we have a board meeting next week. I'm just starting to get my head together for that. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, and Helen is just a, a little nod. Um, we're it's Oasis is being showcased in a, in Vancouver actually, in a I guess there's a community and there's a a radio show. There's mm -hmm. a whole hour segment. So, <laughs> thanks, Helen. Thank you, Helen. Yeah, I I think just to throw a word in, you know, this this uh, pandemic has really challenged us to figure out how to how to make this work. How do you provide socialization and support to people to prevent them from becoming isolated when you're always at a distance? And I think just as we've learned so far and all the great work that Catherine and Vince have, have uh, talked about today has really been a learning experience about how do we really effectively support older people? And I think they've done a fab fabulous job. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks, everybody. I don't know if there's any further questions. <laughs> I'm looking at the time. It's it's almost one o'clock. So, um, Sherry, this is gonna this has been uh, recorded, and so it will get popped up for for people to take a look at. Anyway, thanks, everybody, for attending. It's um, a great first session, and look forward to Dr. McCall's um, in June. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.